funeral races out there <laughs> said that. I trust by the time you leave today that your hearts will really be encouraged. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Last week, we talked about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We talked about there's eight pillars that are foundations to the Christian faith. There might be ten, I don't know. But I figured out eight of them. And uh, two of them are preached today. The love of God, is you hear a lot about that, and you hear about the grace of God a lot. But there are six of them that are pretty much neglected in a lot of the preaching today. And so we've gone through, and Will has asked me to go and take those six things and synthesize them down. So I'm really taking like two or three hours worth of material and bringing it down, try it hopefully within half an hour. <laughs> so... We're either going to go 90 miles an hour through the thing, or I cut a lot of stuff out. And so I did both. We're going to race through some things. And usually when I do this, I present it. I use a lot of illustrations and so forth from real life and so forth. Those had to go. So I'm going to minimize those and just pretty much concentrate on the meat of the, of the uh, material. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about pillar one, pillar two. And pillar one is this. There are two, the existence of two kingdoms on earth. There's the kingdom of God, and it said that Jesus Christ came to earth as a little baby to establish the kingdom of God on earth. We talked about in the Gospel of Luke, uh, it's 44 times mentioned the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And in the Gospel of Matthew, it talks about 55 times the kingdom of heaven. But we don't hear too much about that preached from the pulpits these days or your radio or, or television preachers. And then there's another kingdom that exists, and that's the kingdom of Satan. And it's called, he is called the God of this world. This is the creator God, and this is the God of this world. And mankind chose him as their new leader back in the Garden of Eden. Sadly so. And so we established that thing. The second thing is... The second pillar is, and I developed them last week, there is a judgment that is coming on the world. Jesus spoke about judgment uh, more than anybody else in Scripture. And that is not often preached today because people say, we don't want to hear about hellfire and brimstone. You know what I mean? That type of stuff. Well, I tell you what, a reality is judgment is coming. It says that in the Scripture several places. It says those who are in the body of Christ are going to be judged. And our judgment, hopefully, is different. And we're going to get a reward for how we lived on earth. And those in this kingdom over here are going to also be judged. And, and the ones who follow him, who refuse to live under God's management, are going to be judged along with him. And it says there's a place reserved for them, and there's a place reserved for the people who decide to live under God's management system. That's called heaven and Satan and his angels, and those who follow him on this earth, who basically have the same attitude that Satan had. Satan had the attitude, God, I'm not going to do what you want anymore. I'm going to be an independent thinker. I'm going to do my thing. And God said, that is inconsistent with heaven. Bang, he threw him out of heaven, and he crashed earth. And I said last week, I don't know why God put him on earth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Put him on Mars or some other place, but uh, God chose to put him here with us. So, those two pillars we talked about last week, and if you have a question about last week, theological and so forth, there are uh, handouts in the back here that I had from my discipleship group. We went through this, and you can pick up a handout. And, I, and if there's something wrong in there, you tell me about it, because I don't want to preach something that's wrong. But this is actually an evolution of my thoughts and uh, the thoughts of uh, the original people who wrote this. And I have my confidence not in what preachers today say, but I want to go back and have my confidence in the guys who walked with Jesus. The first hand that counts. And that's where I'm going to put my faith. Because they watched him doing the miracles that validated his faith. Now, where is the power of God? I'm going to talk today about two more pillars. And one of the things that I, that I told the group last, uh, last session is, I've been in this a long time. When I was 18 years old, 
between my freshman and sophomore years at Purdue University. I went to a, a conference, and uh, we had a guy there that gave a challenge, and he said this, if you're willing today, this evening, it was this evening, like 250, 300 students there, he said, if you're willing to give your life to Jesus Christ to let him manage your life, and if you're willing to go anywhere in the world to serve him, will you stand up? And out of 250, 300 people, I was one of about 25 people that stood up. From that point on, Jesus Christ, God the Father, became a reality to me. Now, I'd been in church most of my life, but I'd never heard that, that message that God wanted to, to control my life, to manage my life, so that I didn't have to live under this management anymore, that I could actually live under God's management system. And that was a revelation to me. And so for the last 58 years, I've tried to live under God's management system. And the evolution of, uh, of that whole process is called growth and maturity. Okay? Sanctification. Now, I've heard a lot of responses over the years in talking with people. And pillar number three is this. Jesus Christ is the only way that people can be saved from hell and receive eternal life. That is a pillar in the Christian faith. In other words, there's no other way that a human being can find salvation, which is an eternal relationship with God, than through Jesus Christ. That is an essential pillar of faith. I want to define that for you. Now, I've heard people say, well, all roads lead to the same place. God looks on the intent of your heart. And if I have good intentions, I believe I will get into heaven. I was counseling a man one time, and he was going through a divorce, and he said, uh, I believe I'm a good person, and God understands that, and he'll let me into heaven. And I stopped, and I said, uh, would your wife and kids testify to that? He got real quiet. One person said, I believe in God, that's enough. So I just sit and I said, do you believe there's a devil? He said, yeah. I said, do you believe that, uh, do you believe, think that he believes in God? Yeah, I guess so. Is he going to be in heaven? I think sometimes we just ask people questions and help them to process what they say. And he said, well, I don't think so. I don't want him there. I said, yeah, right. So the devil knows there's a God, and just believing in God, is that enough to get you into heaven? Well, there are so many religions in the world, how do I know which one's the right one? For years and years, I taught world history, and we taught the eight major religions of the world. Shinto, you know what I mean? Confucius, uh, Islam, Christianity. And Christianity among the world religions is a very unique religion. Okay, if you want to call it a religion, because it's not about religion. It's not about what we do to get into good graces with God. It's about a relationship, an eternal relationship that begins here on earth and goes into eternity. And we want to clarify some of that going on. There are a couple things when I was a young Christian that I heard. There was a guy named George Bernard Shaw. He was a famous playwright, and this is what he said. He said, I would be a Christian if it weren't for Christians. That was a sobering thought. I heard that when I was about 18 or 19 years old. There was another man that was really famous back in the 50s and 60s and so forth. And he basically, this is not an exact quote, this is as much as I could remember. He said, I have studied Jesus' teachings, and I would be a Christian but I have never found a person who attends church who actually follows his teachings. Isn't that sad? His name was Gandhi. You ever hear of him? He was helping the, in the liberation of India from the British, you know what I'm saying? The established Indian. He said, I would be a Christian, but I haven't seen anybody. It's actually, he actually studied the teaching of Jesus, and he said, the people in church... They're not living that stuff. 
So when I heard some of these things, as a young man I committed, I want to be that one guy, hopefully, that somebody could look at and say, there goes one. Now that, that happened in my heart and resolved that I want to be that one guy that says, you mean, look at me, because I'm in all efforts of what I'm trying to do in life, I'm trying to follow Christ imperfectly, but I'm trying. I had uh, my son, Ben, his best friend in high school, his name was Brian. And Brian, at one point, seemed like he was an agnostic. And uh, Ben has had a burden for him for years. About within the last year, Brian came to his home and was there. And so Ben broached the subject again. He says, Brian, have you, have you got things right with the Lord yet? Brian says this. He says, your dad's in good with God, isn't he? Brian, or John, Ben says, yeah. He said, I'll tell you what. Your dad's probably going to die one of these days. And he's going to go to heaven. And he's going to put in a good word for me. And, uh, you know, then when I get to heaven, God will let me in. And Ben looked at him and he says, Brian, that's not the way it works. You've got to develop your own relationship with God. You can't go through my dad. You've got to go through the Savior you know, and to get to heaven. And uh, we were at a family gathering one time. We were talking about Christianity. And um, one of the people there said, I'm an excellent negotiator. And, you know, when I get to heaven, I'll negotiate with God, and he'll let me into heaven. My wife's smiling. She remembers that. You know what? Everybody's got a plan, don't they? But whose effort, they want to redefine it the way they want. God, you fit in my box. You understand? I don't want to fit into your will. And that's one of the key themes that resonates through all of this. Why should I trust my salvation to Jesus Christ? I'm going to go through why I personally trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. First of all, Jesus has some unique credentials. As I taught the, the religions of the world, there are three things about Jesus Christ that are different than any other religion. Number one, it says that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he was born of a virgin. Now, there are ways we can impregnate women today, artificial insemination, and a virgin could actually have a baby. That didn't exist back when he was born. And Mary and Joseph and a number of people testified that Jesus Christ was divinely conceived, right? The angel came and visited Joseph. So that is something that no other religion in the world can claim. Their founder cannot claim that they were conceived of the Holy Spirit. That's a unique thing about Jesus. The second thing is, when they brought Jesus in trial at the Sanhedrin to put him to death, they tried to find people that would testify that he had sinned, that he had broken the law somehow. Now, he was raised in a family, and his brothers and sisters, and those disciples walked with him for three years. And do you know what? They couldn't find a single person to say that Jesus Christ ever sinned. So they had to bring two people in, two false witnesses, right, to, to condemn him. He, was, he lived a sinless life. Because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. The third thing is, he was the only person in history that ever rose from the dead of his own power. Now, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and other people were raised from, from his power, right? The, the only son and so forth. But he's the only person in history that was raised from the dead from his own power. And that is a historical fact. There was a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus that is well accepted in circles, and Josephus wrote about the, the trauma that the Jewish community went through when Jesus was raised from the dead. He talked about the effect it had upon the Roman Empire, and he talked about you know, when they found the empty tomb and stuff like that, that it caused a big ruckus and all of that. So that is a historical fact. It also correlates with what was going on with Roman historians. Now, the second thing about Jesus was he was a perfect sacrifice because he was sinless. 
It was a perfect sacrifice. In Leviticus 17, it talks about what is necessary when they made animal sacrifices, and that animal had to be without blemish. It had to be a perfect. It didn't have a, whether it be a lamb or whether it be uh, uh, what do you call it, a goat or whether it be a heifer. That animal had to be without blemish. And so here Jesus was a perfect sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 922 it says this, Without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. That's King James. It says, in this verse it says, Without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. So somehow in God's economy, the way he sees it, blood has to be shed for sin. And God shed the first blood. You remember in Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what happened? Some animals died for him to make clothing for them. Remember, they, they were naked. And so God shed the first blood because of sin. And so in God's economy somehow, don't ask me to understand it or explain that. I don't know. Just like the law of gravity, if you drop a pencil, it hits the floor. That is a law of God, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Okay. The next thing, in 1 Timothy 2.5, it talks about Jesus, and it says this. For there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and man. That man is Christ Jesus. There's one God, and there's one mediator. What's a mediator do? He does what? He brings the two warring parties together. One God and one mediator. And that mediator for people who are Christians who committed Jesus Christ is also an intercessor. I think it's in John 17 where he says that Jesus Christ makes intercession for you and me daily. Isn't that interesting? That if you belong to him, he explains constantly to the Father and makes intercession for you. That's humbling to think about that. That if I choose to live in his kingdom here on earth and management, that I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is constantly making intercession for me and all of you who belong to him. Pretty humbling. The fourth thing about Jesus Christ, and this is the most controversial one, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. All roads lead to the same place. Jesus smashed that. Now that's either a true statement or a false statement. If it's a true statement, then you have to embrace Jesus Christ as the only way to get to the Father. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar. And I was talking with somebody who used to attend a church here several years ago, and they said, well, I just can't accept that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. I said, okay, let's say after me, Jesus Christ is a liar. Oh, no, no, I can't say that. Oh, wait a minute. You said he didn't tell the truth, so let's call him a liar. The person wouldn't do it. But I, I, I'm glad. You know I mean, That's a pretty serious accusation to say. But if you deny that Jesus is the only way, that's what you're calling him. You're calling him a liar. And guess who's going to turn out to be the liar? If we do that, and there's a statement in the book of Revelation when it talks about the people who are going to inhabit hell, and it says, all liars. That's pretty serious. Well, let's move on to pillar four, and this is one I want to major on. Pillar four says this, there is no salvation without repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. Jesus Christ is the only way, okay, that we can be saved. And you cannot live under the management of Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom at the same time. In Matthew 6, 24, the King James Version, Jesus said this, you can't serve both God and mammon. It's inconsistent. You're going to serve one and love the one and hate the other one or hate the one and love the other one. That's what Jesus said. So we're in this dilemma. You're serving one camp or the other camp. Now, let's talk a little bit about repentance. I was talking with a preacher about eight years ago or so, 
and he had a situation in his church, and he felt that a person in his church had repented. But I didn't, I had some questions about that. We're, it, we had saying, a mutual friend, because he said, repentance means a change of mind. Okay? That's part of it. Certainly your mind's got to change. But that's not exactly what repentance is, according to the scripture. Repentance is more than a change of mind. In Acts chapter 26, 20, it says this. First to those in Damascus, and then those in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached. Well, who's it talking here? Paul is preaching. And he says, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. When a genuine repentance happens, there's always a change in the behavior. That's what it says. Let me give you an example. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, it talks about a thief. G, uh, Paul is talking about a thief. He says, a thief is not, does not stop being a thief just because when he stops stealing. Now, most of us would think, well, yeah, if he stops stealing, he's not a thief anymore. Well, stop and think of this. Some of the people I've counseled were locked up in jail, and they were thieves, and they weren't stealing. Did they cease being a thief when they were in jail? What about the guy that jumped out of the second story window trying to get away from the homeowner and broke his leg and was in the hospital? Has he ceased being a thief because he's in the hospital room? He can't steal. So when does a thief stop being a thief? Here's what, here's what uh, Ephesians 4.28 says. It says, a thief stops being a thief when he starts working with his own hands and starts giving away. You can read it. You guys are smart. You got a Bible? So a guy then ceases being a thief and starts being a philanthropist because a person who works with his hands and gives things away, that's what he does under God's management. But under Satan's management, he's what? Known as a thief because he takes stuff that's not his to support himself. Okay, does that make sense? Under one management system or the other. Now, in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, he says, In the same way, faith by itself is not a comp if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, you can say you have faith over here. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. But how in the world can you have faith without deeds? Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do, my deeds. Okay? So an evidence that a person is really repented is what they do afterward. It's not necessarily what they say they do. Now, here's this problem that we have here. Some people believe that agreement with God is repentance. That's called confession. That's not repentance. Let me give you an example from real life. When I was a kid, I was about 12 years old. John Kennedy was running against Richard Nixon. Some of you remember that back then. And uh, my dad was not a, re he was kind of a Republican, but he voted for Democrats and Republicans. He would be called an independent today. But he had a friend, and I'll call him named Tom. He was a committed Democrat. So they were talking on the porch. Of course, I was 12 year old, I was over listening to this. And he says, uh, you know, Lauren, who are you gonna vote for? So my dad said, well, I've thought about this a lot. And my dad listed five reasons why he thought that Nixon was a better candidate than John Kennedy. And then Tom sat there and he thought, you know, that's right. He this, eh? and Tom said, wow, I never thought about that, Lauren. That's amazing. You know what I'm saying? He said, definitely, Nixon is a better candidate. Well, after the election is over, you know, Kennedy won. So Tom comes back over. He says, uh, they got to talk about politics. And he said, you think Kennedy's going to make it? And my dad said, well, hopefully, you know, he'll make some decisions for good and so forth. He said, Lauren, he said, I tell you what. He said, I, I went into that vote and vote, and I thought about what you said about Kennedy, you know what I mean, not being as good a candidate as Nixon. He said, you know, I got in there 
And he thought, he said, this is what I thought. I'm a Democrat. I've always been a Democrat. I will always be a Democrat. And he said, when I, get, I just had to pull a straight ticket for the Democrat ticket. Now, I was this kid sitting there thinking, now, but I think people treat God like that. They'll agree with you that God has superiority. They want to get saved and all of these other things. But when it comes right down to it, when it's time to pull the thing, they come back to what's natural. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, that's, who, that's our nature. That's who we are. And that is not repentance. Faith and repentance means I believe what God says, and I don't do what I normally do, and I do what God tells me to do. That's what repentance is. Now, in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, this is what Jesus taught. Jesus said, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and forgiveness of sins are married together. Today we hear forgiveness of sins being preached, but I don't hear a whole lot about repentance. And he said, that should be preached to every nation. That's part of the gospel. Let's take a look. We've got a situation in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, in which Peter is talking to a whole group of, of people that have just seen God do a tremendous thing. And here's what he says. He says, Peter, they asked him, said, what must me do to be saved? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized in the name, every, no, wait a minute, repent and be baptized every one of you. See that, every one of you? In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what precedes baptism? Repentance. Baptism and the forgiveness of sins are married. Baptism and repentance. Repentance always precedes what? Baptism. They're married. And yet today, with the gospel, that's not necessarily a, uh, really emphasized. Everywhere in Scripture, repentance precedes genuine salvation. And I challenge you, if you don't believe that, prove me wrong. From the Scriptures. Not what your opinion is. From the Scriptures. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, it talks about three things that happened as a result when people really repented. And here's what it says. It says, the people came together, and it says, and they devoted themselves to three things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the original guys who walk with Jesus, they, what's it mean to devote yourself? You really work at it, right? You give yourself to it. And that's a sign, if I would see, if somebody says they're really committed, they're going to serve Jesus, and they're really saved, are they committed, are they devoted to the apostles' teachings? Are they having a relationship with the Word of God? And if they're not, Scripture says, are they really saved? I don't know. But it says that these guys, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The second thing they did, they devoted themselves to fellowship. And the third thing, they, they devoted themselves to prayer. Now, if you've been in, living under Satan's kingdom over here, and you want to live under God's, those three things ought to be pretty important to you. And so you find somebody, and that process is called sanctification, where... I was no good to God, and I become useful to God. I'm set apart, sanctified, I'm set apart for his purposes now, not Satan's purposes. Okay? And he can't use me for his purposes if I'm sanctified and living for God's purposes. And sometimes that's another name for that. It's called discipleship. Sanctification is... Discipleship is taking people who have been under Satan's management and teaching them how to live under God's management system. 
It says the second thing about them, they had a very different view of their possessions. They recognized that God owns everything and that God is trusting you with certain things and he's going to, you're going to have to give an account someday of the possessions that he has entrusted you with. Have you been a good steward of what God has given you? And they were. The third thing, it says these people were glad. They were happy people. They had joy in their heart and they praised God and their worship was accepted by God. And as a result, it said God showed them favor. You know what favor is? Favor is a blessing you may have got. And when God finds somebody that he can really trust and give something to, he'll give them more of it. Remember the parable of the talents? This guy made, took his five talents and turned. He gave them more. And so they show, had the favor of God. Now, what is the true gospel that Paul preached? I'm going to read something from Galatians. It's not up on the screen. But I'd like you to really listen carefully. Paul's saying, in verse, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, he says, but even if... We, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you. Let him be eternally condemned. What's that mean? If somebody's out there, see that happened even in the first century. There were people going out and modifying the teaching of the gospel to make it more palatable or to bring it back into Jewish tradition. And he says, let him be. And then he goes on in verse 9. He says, as we have already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Eternally. You're part of the devil's plan. If you're preaching a different gospel than what these guys preach. You hear that very often? It's a serious thing to get up here and to represent God because everything I'm telling you, I'm going to be judged for by the living God. I don't dare tell you something that I can't come back to here as a foundation. So what is that gospel that Paul preached? Let's take a look at Acts chapter 26, 15 to 20. Here's the context of it. He's talking to a guy named Festus who took Pilate's place, you know, he was a Roman ruler, what do you call it, governor. And Festus had invited King Agrippa and his wife into the situation. He says, look, Paul's here, he's a prisoner, I've got to send him to Rome. What am I going to charge him with? The guy's committed no crime. What am I going to charge him with? He says, Agrippa, will you sit in here and listen to this guy's story and tell me what I should send charges to Rome with? So Agrippa agreed to that. They came with pomp and circumstance. They drag old Paul out of prison, bring him in. He said, okay. Explain to us what's going on. So Paul gives his testimony. He says, going to Damascus, big old light came through, like this one right here, shined on me and knocked me off my horse. And, and then I'm going to start with verse 15. He said, then I asked, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you and appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and what you will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. And I am sending you to them, and get this, verse 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are, see that word, sanctified by me. See that sanctification process? It's a process we go through from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom over here. So we're sanctified in that process. We're going to talk next week how that happens, okay? Because two of those pillars are related to that. It says, and then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, First to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should, listen to this, repent and turn to God and to prove their repentance by what? Their deeds, what they do. That's the gospel. That's just simple gospel. The two kingdoms we talked about last week, you know, the pillars and stuff like that. So we come down to it. 
And Paul says, if you're preaching something other than that, may you be eternally condemned. Pretty serious thing. There are two people listen, a bunch of people listening there, and two of them, one of them's named Festus, and Festus, what's his response? In verse 25, Paul, you're nuts. I can imagine Paul probably figured out Festus was sitting there going, oh, brother. No? And he, so that's an immediate response to the gospel. He says, you're nuts. But Agrippa didn't respond that way. Agrippa's sitting there, and Agrippa said in verse 20, he said, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian in such a short time? Now, why do you think the response of Festus and Agrippa was different? Because Festus didn't have any pillars in his life. He's like a lot of kids out there right now. They don't have a clue about what Christianity is about. Nobody's told them. And so immediately, they hear this stuff, and they're easily misled. They come out, and they're exposed to the world, and they just follow what the world says because they've never been shown the alternative. There have been no pillars in their life. But Agrippa had some pillars. He'd been exposed to Christians, and he had been exposed to the Jewish people and so forth. So he had some pillars. So he didn't throw it out immediately. So he's considering it. And we don't know whether he became a believer or not. Maybe he thought, well, maybe Jesus will ask me to give up being king. This is an important position. I don't want to give my kingship up, right? Remember the rich young ruler? He said, get rid of your loot. Give it to the poor and come follow me. He said, uh-uh. Maybe this is how, I don't know. But in John 5.24, there's a different response, a third response, when you're given the gospel. And Jesus said this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Now what's it mean to believe? I'm going to give you an illustration. It's true, based on a true story. There was a guy named Charles Blondin. He was a Frenchman. He came to the United States in uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And he was an, like an acrobat, you know. You got a picture of him up there. Thank you. That's really cool. So they put a, a cable between two of those skyscrapers in New York. He, he went back and forth on that. So somebody came up with the idea, we're going to put a cable across Niagara Falls. They, I think they just wanted to see him fall in or something. I don't know. So they got him up there, and he went, and he went across the falls and came back. So then he goes and he gets a wheelbarrow. That's the best rendition of that. <laughs> Sorry. He gets this wheelbarrow. It only has one wheel. And he takes that wheelbarrow and goes across. <laughs> then you know what he said? He said, throw a bag of, of, of grain in there, you know, or seed or something. So they put this big old sack of feed in there. You guess it? He made it. And then he looked at the people out there and he says this. How many of you believe I can take a person across? I can just imagine. <laughs> so he looked and he said, you, you raise your hand, get in. <laughs> you, get in. You. He couldn't get one person in that whole group of people to get in that wheelbarrow to go across that falls. Now i got a question for you. Did they believe? If they believed, what would they have done? Somebody, I can imagine somebody said, here's an orphan kid, throw him in. You know what I mean? Something like that. But not of one person. They all said what? A bunch of them. They wanted to see this happen. Listen, the type of faith that moves the heart of God is when we get in a wheelbarrow. And we relinquish control of our lives. And we give that control to him. And then our destiny is tied with his ability to guide our lives. You know, as you're going down the river of life, there's many bends in a lot. And there's only one person 
that knows around that man. Who is that? It's him. Because our, he's our creator. That kind of faith is the kind of faith that moves the heart of God. And God can empower that kind of a person because that person will not misuse the power of God. If you give the power of God to those people over there, what are they going to do? They serve the wrong ends. So I challenge you today. We got a whole bunch of kids out there. I used to be a teacher, all right? Got a bunch of kids who are lost. And they have not seen people get in the wheelbarrow. And they are rejecting Jesus Christ because they don't see. They're like Gandhi. They might be exposed to teachings, but they say, I don't see anybody living it out. Are you willing to live this out? I don't care if you're 75 or 80 years old. Are you willing to take today from now on and be a demonstration to a lost world of the power of God in your life because you submit and let him run the wheel well? Now, if you've done that, or you want to do that today, I'm going to challenge you to stand up just like I did 58 years ago. So if you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and you're willing to get in your wheelbarrow, stand up. And don't tell do it for me because you're talking to God. Don't lie to God, please. <laughs> don't lie to God. I'd rather you stay seated and have integrity that way than to stand up because of peer pressure. Now, there's more than 12 people here, and 12 people made that decision back after Jesus died, and they turned the whole world upside down, didn't they? Yeah. They messed up the Jewish situation, and they messed up the Roman Empire. we got more than 12 people here. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for the examples you bring us in life, and I want to thank you for the word of God and the men of God that sacrificed their lives. Every single disciple, Lord, except John, died a, a martyr's death. That's what it said. Because they got in the wheelbarrow and let you direct their destiny. And I pray for these people who have stood up in faith. And I pray, Lord, you would anoint them with the grace of God and that the Spirit of God would take their lives. And as we talk about next week, we're going to talk about how to let the Spirit of God manage your life and direct your life, and it's not rocket science. And I pray for them, Lord, that you would sustain them this week, and as they've made this decision, you would protect them from Satan's kingdom, who's going to try to hurt them. And I pray that in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.